بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو نیوز روم آمیہ ہو سما خالد بات ٹوڈے از دا ٹویلتھ آف دسمبر ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی تھری آر دیز آر دا اسٹوریز دیٹ وی ول بی ہائی لائٹنگ ڈورنگ دا کورس آف دا شو ویل بگن لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمین ود دی انڈین سپریم کورٹس بائیس ڈسیزن ایز فار ایز دا اسپیشل سیریز آف انڈین انلیگلی آکیوپائڈ جموں اینڈ کشمیر از کنسرن اٹ ہیز ڈسائڈ اگینسٹ دا یو لیٹرل ایبروگیشن آف دا اسپیشل سیریز آف کشمیر وی ہیو ہیڈ مینی ریئیکشنس فرام دا ورلڈ فرام چائنا فرام ادر کنٹریز ایز ویل پاکستان ہیز گیون اے ویری اسٹرانگ ریبٹل ٹو اٹ ود ایٹ بی آر فارن آفس ود ایٹ بی مسٹر جیلانی آور کیئر منسٹر فار فارن افیئرز or whether it be all the other important Kashmir leaders across the world. The reaction has been unanimous as far as uh, this decision has been taken. The, this decision doesn't reflect in any way uh, the judicial uh, aspect of uh, a, uh, a, a problem and issue that has been pending since decades and for which resolutions have been present inside of the United Nations. So a country like India or any other country cannot lay their hand on the uh, in illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, claiming it as their own, if uh, the status is al- already challenged since decades in the United Nations. This is going to be our first story. Our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns what is happening as far as Palestine is concerned and of course uh, the different uh, barbarities that now I have extended to, to the West Bank. They were already there. They were already were hearing things happening in the West Bank, but now they have accelerated that as well, uh, which uh, is uh, has been w- which we are seeing in the form of now different deaths and uh, the different uh, maneuvering that uh, Israel is doing as far as West Bank is concerned. But of course, North Gaza, uh, Southern Gaza are already uh, under the impact. of uh, the barbarities of Israel. This said, there's going to be a special uh, session of the United Nations as well, the UNG as well today. Uh, and uh, we expect some kind of a resolution that might be passed by the United Nations General Assembly. The fact is that here there is no veto power unlike the United Nations Security Council. So this resolution might be passed. But will this resolution have any impact as far as action is concerned uh, on this uh, current situation in Palestine is a huge question. This is what we are going to discuss in our uh, third, uh, second story, in fact, ladies and gentlemen. Then we are going to talk about uh, COP28. Uh, today was the last day of uh, COP28. There has been a draft deal as far as uh, the COP is concerned, but there are many objections that have been raised as far as different countries are concerned. All 198 countries need to agree uh, on this draft agreement in order for it to be passed uh, at the end of COP28. There's a lot of backlash on the fossil fuels as well during the COP28 talks that has happened. Will there be a, a, a final justifiable resolution Uh, to this uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, issue is something that uh, all eyes are on as far as COP28 is concerned. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, story, uh, this uh, today's uh, newsroom, and of course, today's newsroom begins uh, with the, what happened on the night of 11th and 12th of December 2023, where heightened activities in Deira Ismail Khan uh, district happened, uh, where in a total of 27 terrorists were uh, sent to hell in uh, three different operations uh, that happened. The intelligence-based operation was conducted in general area uh, Darazinda uh, on reported presence of terrorists. Terrorists hide out were busted. 17 terrorists were sent to hell. In another intelligence-based operation in the general area Kulachi, own troops effectively engaged terrorists in, as a result of which four terrorists were sent to hell. Uh, two brave sons of soil also uh, fought gallantly and embraced Shahadat in this. In the early hours of the 12th of December 2023, a s- group of six terrorists uh, attacked uh, the security forces post in general area uh, Daraban and of course this was thwarted by the security forces. Uh, the, the resulting blast led to the collapse of the building causing multiple casualties. 23 brave soldiers embraced Shahadat while six terrorists were effectively engaged and uh, sent to health sanitizer. Of sanitization operations are also going in as we speak, going on in fact in these three areas. But the fact is that these three operations uh, resulted in the effect of elimination of all those who were uh, uh, impl- implicated or involved in these uh, heinous activities against Pakistan, against uh, Pakistan's defense and of course against uh, Pakistani nation and the Pakistanis. And it is thanks to our armed forces we need to understand the effective uh, policies, the measures that are being taken uh, by uh, our uh, f- all those forces that are all as part of our first line of defense and how they are thwarting all the evil designs whether they come from across the border or from other entities uh, that do not want Pakistan to be stabilized. 
This said, let's come to now our second story, ladies and gentlemen, and that concerns the uh, Indian Supreme Court's biased decision as far as the special status of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir is concerned. We've been joined in the studio by Sundas Malik. She's the chairperson of uh, United Jammu and Kashmir Coalition. Sundas, thank you very much to have joined us. Sundas, first of all, thank you very much to have come all thank the way to the studios. Having. Normally, our interaction is on Skype, so it's always a wonderful uh, uh, change to see you face to face. This decision by the Supreme Court, how do you see it? A, coming from a Supreme Court of any country, whether it be India or any country, is this a justifiable uh, you know, uh, uh, decision that has come from the highest court of a country that considers itself to be the largest democracy in the world? Uh, well, uh, firstly, thank you for having me. Uh, and it's a pleasure being in the studio with you, especially uh, since the verdict has come against uh, all Kashmiris and I being a Kashmiri myself uh, only uh, recognize the fact that the Indian Supreme Court unfortunately has played the part um, of an adherent court, mm. uh, a court which is adhering to the political whims and fancies of the BJP government. Mm. Uh, and it has again satisfied the will of its Hindutva and extremist supporters uh, by passing uh, this verdict. Uh, because I, I fail to see any representation uh, of the will of the Kashmiri people uh, by this verdict. Uh, so it raises uh, serious questions uh, about the legitimacy of the highest court uh, in the Indi in, uh, Indian judicial system. I'd also like to add that uh, just before the verdict came a week before, uh, Mr. Modi and Amit Shah pa uh, passed two bills concerning Kashmir, including the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Bill. So it says a lot about their uh, um, sort of preemption as far as this uh, verdict was concerned. And I think they were uh, very much satisfied uh, by the uh, Supreme Court and how they would play out this uh, justification in front of the world uh, the, the, about the abrogation of Article 370. So um, serious questions about the Supreme Court uh, and uh, complete and utter dissatisfaction with the verdict. Uh, and it raises severe questions about not only the justice system but about the Indian democracy itself. So it's uh, it's an, an unfortunate thing that's happening uh, in India at the moment. What do you? How do you see the effectiveness of the Indian Supreme Court? I don't want to attack a, a, a judiciary, but the fact remains that seeing this decision and previous decisions, if you remember, well, June 2022, the Supreme Court ruled against preventing Hindu extremists from demolishing Muslims home, Muslim homes in Uttar Pradesh. If you go back in March 22, the Karnataka High Court also banned Muslim students from wearing the hijab. In 2018, Indian court acquitted a BJP leader. Maya Kodnani, if you remember well. Then there is the whole Babri Mosque issue yes, that yes. the Supreme Court is involved with as well. Can we call the Supreme Court an effective neutral organization as far as India is concerned? I, I, I again would like to say uh, we, we should call uh, the Indian Supreme Court more of a political uh, institution rather than a justice uh, institution because as you have quoted before and as I would like to add furthermore that uh, the uh, Afzal Guru verdict is another uh, you know stain on the Indian judicial system where it says said right in the verdict that it was passed only to satisfy the will of the collective conscious of the Indian people. So I think uh, the Indian Supreme Court uh, has failed again, like I said, the people, mm. and it 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 should be questioned, and it needs to be questioned when it uh, when it passes verdicts against its own constitution uh, so blatantly. So it's it's a huge uh, question about uh, what the Indian judicial system has come to, and there is no uh, um, you know insult in calling a spade a spade, and mm. the Indian Supreme Court has been sold out to the BJP government. When the five-judge bench, which was headed by the Chief Justice of India, Mr. Chandra Chud, confirms that the President can now voluntarily issue a notification that Article 370 ceases to exist, and I quote again, cease, three, Article 370 ceases to exist, what is the future then now of Article 370 and then 35A? Well, again, uh, the, uh, the the uh, three seven uh, the Article three seventy and its removal again, like I said, it's against the Constitution of India itself, yeah. where it said that the Constituent Assembly uh, would be the only one who would decide whether the revocation of Article three seventy uh, is necessary and whether they would like to become part of the uh, Indian Union. Secondly, uh, it is also a violation of Article fifty one of the Indian Constitution, where they have. Uh, 
promise to adhere to any international treaty uh, and as we know that uh, the Kashmir dispute is still an internationally recognized it dispute. It was India that itself went to the yes, United Nations yes. way back so in the any, late any action that they take uh, falls under primacy of law. Mm. So they cannot pass any unilateral decision uh, in uh, concerning an international dispute. So uh, the Indi like I said it's, uh, it's a horror show mm. uh, and uh, it can, I think, only result in further uh, chaos because there are f more unions who have been given more power than the Kashmir uh, Union under 370 was given. There's Article 371 that allows further powers to other unions, but it raises serious questions about the uh, intention uh, of the Supreme Court when passing this verdict because as we know that uh, Kashmir is a Muslim majority and as we know that the government currently uh, ruling India uh, is an extremist Hindutva government which is extremely anti-Muslim. So uh, it is not only I think about politics and economy, uh, it is also I think a huge um, uh, stain on uh, the Indian government as far as its uh, secular uh, image is concerned. I don't think India is secular anymore. Which secular image? You <laughs> yes. know, this is a huge question <laughs> as well. And I think there was, there's no longer any secularism or pluralism uh, or a democracy as such as far as India is concerned. And I have to say that on the record. So this, uh, uh, what happens as far as the Kashmiris are concerned? What is now the resolve post resolution of the Kashmiri leaders from, uh, from across the board, whether they be in the Indian Hill Valley or in Azar Jammu in Kashmir or across the world? What is their resolve post this, this decision by the Supreme Court? Well, uh, barring a few uh, facilitators of uh, this abrogation, including Ms. Mehbooba Mufti and uh, Farooq mm. Abdullah and Sajad Lone and people of their ilk, I think the political leadership currently imprisoned uh, mm. vehemently stands against th this decision. But Mehbooba Mufti herself is under house arrest, if I'm not wrong. Well, th I, I like their optics and their okay. dramatizations. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I know that it's all for political gain. And okay. as a Kashmiri, like I said, we understand where their political interests mm. lie, not with the people, but with mm. power. So um, as far as uh, resistance politics is concerned, as far as our true leaders are concerned, the, uh, maybe that may be Masarat Alam Bhatt Saab mm. or Yaseen Malik Saab mm. or uh, Asiyan Rabi Saab, we know where they stand and mm. we know where the leadership of AJK stand and we know that it will not uh, hurt the resolve of the Kashmiri people because we never adhere to the Indian constitution. We do not recognize the uh, power of the Indian constitution. Because the Indian the illegally occupation in Kashmir is, a special, is it, under a special state. As, exactly. as prescribed by various resolutions that exactly. are with the United Nations. Exactly. So, and not only the uh, uh, United Nations, it is the people itself. We have never accepted the Indian occupation. As you know, we have always resisted against it. And I think the, uh, the resistance will continue uh, in occupied Kashmir against this uh, illegal, brutal occupation. Uh, and I think Modi's design to uh, somehow exploit Kashmir of its economy and its resources, I think it's going to badly fail because uh, even as you know, after the abrogation of Article uh, 370 and 35A, uh, they, b uh, they made claims such as, you know, new Kashmir and democracy and uh, Paris and all of that. And we saw that how G20 t tourism mm. summit was only attended by, you know, lower level diplomats and they couldn't bear to, uh, you know, parade. And how it was done in an enclosed space. Exactly, because they feared the reaction for, from mm. Kashmiri. So again, uh, I think it, it, it is an action based uh, out of fear mm. uh, and uh, they know that the people of Kashmir will never accept the Indian government as uh, their governing body. How has Pakistan reacted to all of this? I saw a reaction of the special representative of for religious harmony in Islamic uh, countries, Hafiz Tahir uh, Mahmoud Ashrafi, who said Pakistan will raise the Kashmir issue now at all the international fora, including the OIC. But this Pakistan has always been doing. It has raised it at the UN, it has raised it at the OIC, at the SCU, at all the fora that it can raise the issue. What should Pakistan's resolve be now post this decision, officially and unofficially, in your point of view? Well, 
Pakistan, like I, uh, like you have said, Pakistan has always uh, been very active in its diplomacy on uh, the Kashmir issue. It has supported the people of Kashmir legally, diplomatically, uh, and uh, humanitarian uh, aid has always uh, come forth from Pakistan for the people of Kashmir. But I think after all of this, uh, we need to understand that the international forums that we hold so dear and uh, you know high and mighty, they have failed us. Uh, and I think it is a time for Pakistan to reach out to its allies other than uh, the West, which, which means the UN or the international courts. I think our allies like China, our allies like uh, Turkey, I think they can be uh, far more uh, strong in their response against these actions. Uh, and I think the international community needs to uh, do some introspection because I think for short term uh, economic gains, they're failing humanity really badly and I think they will stand on the wrong side of history. Um, so Pakistan, uh, like I said, will always be on the right side of history. Alhamdulillah, it has stood by the people of Palestine, it has stood by the people of Kashmir, uh, and it will continue to do so. But I think uh, it is time to become a little bit more aggressive uh, towards uh, this issue, because I don't think that India is willing to uh, resolve this matter peacefully. So I think it is uh, important that we um, gather as much support uh, from our allies uh, on this issue and uh, further pressurize India and the West itself that this is not just about an, uh, a bilateral dispute. It is a threat to the regional security because India, it's not going to stop at that. It is being emboldened by the uh, Israeli actions in Palestine. And I think their um, aspirations are far more gruesome when we talk about Akhand Bharat and we, when we talk about saffronization and extremism. Uh, and when, now that we have seen that these death squads are being exported by India uh, from uh, Canada to the US, uh, I think India is a real and imminent threat and it should be recognized as such. And India also needs to be understand that it's, it, needs to be, uh, it needs to stop being baited against its own uh, neighbors. And I think for pre peace to prevail, there needs to be dialogue. You talked about you know India's transnational terrorism that has now gone beyond the seven seas, and we've seen the examples of it in uh, Canada and in the U.S. Do you feel the the policy that the West has had in the past vis-a-vis -vis India through the Asia Pacific strategy and whatnot might change? And in the in the in the context, uh, there might be more attention put on Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and the way India has been treating the region. Well, I think um, as we have seen that the State Department is also worried about uh, what India is doing currently. Mm. Uh, I don't think uh, it can be left unleashed. Uh, whether they want to use India or not, uh, I think it cannot be um, left to run amok in uh, Asia mm. uh, and it needs to be handled by its handlers in the West mm. and it needs to be told that uh, its uh, neighbors, they are not, uh, you know, just sitting ducks, Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, Nepal, they have, and Maldives as we have seen, they, they are sick and tired of India's interference uh, through terrorism uh, in their region and I think there is going to be severe backlash within uh, the region and I think uh, the, the West also uh, is bearing the fruits of uh, this um, sort of freedom that they have allowed India. So I think they, they are reassessing whether they uh, can rely on India uh, because they're, you know, j th this whole secular democracy, this hard jodo <laughs> uh, uh, representation India. of mm. shining India, mm. I think it has now been exposed uh, all over the world. Mm. Uh, India is uh, not, uh, um, you know, uh, an innocent country. Mm. India has far heinous designs than the world recognizes uh, and it needs to be dealt as such. Coming back to Indian legally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, you are a Kashmiri leader, we are two Kashmiris talking about Indian legally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. What, are, uh, what do you foresee as far as the role of Kashmiri leaders including yourself and others in Pakistan, in the Indian Hill Valley, across the world is concerned? post this decision, how do, should all of you move forward in, in how, which is the direction that you want to take now? 
Well, like I said, uh, it is important for uh, everyone, not just the Kashmiri leaders, but the Kashmiri citizens themselves to become effective representatives of what is going on in Kashmir. As we know that uh, the occupied Kashmir territory, uh, the, the, the information uh, coming out of it is very difficult. So when the information reaches us, I think it is our responsibility to make it as, uh, what you say, um, vocal as possible mm. and uh, I think other than diplomacy we we need to uh, recognize that uh, just talking about Kashmir is not enough we need to see the what is happening uh, with the people of Khalistan we need to see what is happening with the people of uh, uh, Mizoram from uh, Assam all these uh, union territories which are being subjugated by the Indian uh, territory so we we need to find allies I think within India as well uh, because there is maybe a small uh, hope within India of people who recognize uh, Hindutva extremism and who stand against it and there are people of those ilk in uh, the diaspora as well. So I think everyone from Kashmir needs to uh, understand and identify that this is a war of identities and India is going to uh, completely eradicate all Kashmiris if uh, the world stays silent and the onus lies on the international community uh, to aid the people of Kashmir uh, and get rid of this uh, illegal, heinous, brutal and blatant occupation. Will the United Nations help seeing what is happening vis-a-vis -vis Palestine? Well, uh, the United Nations, again, uh, we have seen how um, veto powers have uh, used this again to uh, expose themselves I would mm. say uh, so I think if they if they think that they um, from India to the US you know land of liberty freedom mm. and uh, democracy uh, I think they need to understand that these statuses are earned and not just uh, you know put up so uh, if they want to be recognized as uh, these uh, democratic shining beacons of hope uh, I think they need to perform as such and they need to take their duty of uh, effective interference uh, and uh, resolve these issues because like I said it is it is a matter of regional security it is not just a bilateral tiff mm. so it, it's, go it's growing far greater than that uh, finally, Sundas, uh, do you feel that uh, Narendra Modi and his BJP government have been using the Indian Held Valley as a political tool to earn uh, or to increase their vote, uh, voting uh, power? And now that the elections in India are about to happen in a couple of months' time, uh, do you feel this is going to have some kind of a positive or negative repercussion on I'm talking of this decision and the way the Narendra, Modi, Narendra Modi government is moving forward vis as far as Indian Held Kashmir is concerned? Well, the Indian uh, government, as far as Modi is concerned, we, as we know that they uh, claim to be uh, one of the fastest growing economies, but we know that that economy is only limited to only 5% of its mm. citizens. Mm. Not everyone is Ambani, Adani or uh, Tata. So uh, I think in order to satisfy those individuals mm. with hungry stomachs uh, standing at the uh, you know lo lowest stages of uh, global wor world ha hunger index, I think in order to satisfy their conscience they, they they do these things and it is definitely political and I fear that uh, in order to win these elections and gain more political strength they might carry out further attacks on the people of Kashmir on the Muslim minority within India on other minorities within India with mm -hmm. them including Christians and Sikhs mm -hmm. because I think that is their only selling point uh, in Modi has not only I think failed uh, the people of Kashmir it, but it has collectively failed the people of India because this is only an optical illusion nothing to do with reality and that is so true this is an optical illusion and uh, the way Pakistan has been moving forward and highlighting this optical illusion to the world I hope the world finally understands what India's true face is true. something that you have been highlighting time and again as well tomorrow is a special session of the Legislative Assembly of the Azar Jammu and Kashmir uh, Assembly as well and, and our caretaker Prime Minister will be there. So I think maybe some important decisions will be taken, some, some, some of the issues that pertain across or around uh, this decision will also be highlighted uh, and maybe we'll know how Pakistan is going to move forward as well. Hopefully Pakistan will move from strength to strength. Inshallah. Thank you so very much Sundas Malik, Chairperson in the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition to have joined us Thank for you this. Having. Let's come to our second uh, story and that concerns, the rather third story, that concerns uh, the situation as far as uh, Palestine is concerned. Today is day 67 
of the war of the conflict between Palestine and Israel. We've been joined by Raza Shah, is an expert on international relations uh, for this very segment. Raza, thank you very much to have joined us. Raza, the United Nations General Assembly is uh, set to demand on Tuesday an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in this two month long conflict. Will they succeed? Oh, will it succeed? Uh, if you go back uh, post um, 18th, of, uh, 18th of October, this was the first time when the uh, UN General Secretary actually called for a ceasefire. So when we look at the events uh, and the calls uh, from the UN, so far they've been blunt, they've not been effective, and they've not had their... Um, uh, their uh, result so far. So even up until last week, when they invoked Article 99, there was one veto power, which was America, and it said no. Um, will this one be successful? Uh, there is a slim window of opportunity because sometimes you have to keep badgering and keep pondering uh, uh, and and keep on um, pushing the agenda forward till there is enough consensus of the willing to bring this forward. So is there a possibility with this particular one, uh, there is a small window uh, where maybe um, UN can use force. If you go back into 1960 in Congo, uh, Pakistan 1971, Afghanistan um, and Russia 1981, they also called for this same type of ceasefire, this special power by the UN General the Secretary. And only once, I think in Korea, that there was a use of force. Possibility, very small, and I think we need more of the veto powers to come on board and call for this ceasefire. So I want to say I'm hopeful, but um, I will not say no. All right, Raza, also the US, while on the one hand the UNSC did veto the resolution as far as Palestine is concerned, it does uh, put a premium on civilian life as far as a, a statement from the US State Department is concerned. Is the US pressing uh, the Israeli government to uh, reduce the civilian casualties? And if so, will that actually happen? Yes, I do agree with that to a certain extent. If you look at the uh, the wars where America has uh, conducted, whether it be Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and so forth, you see that the American doctrine does include minimal civilian damage. Uh, they call that collateral damage. So you find that within the doctrine. So when they're seeing this gut-wrenching uh, 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 massacre in Gaza, civilian infrastructure that has been decimated, I think this doesn't bode well for the American administration too, because they are the one to be seen the advocates of human rights and freedom of speech and freedom of power. And they're the ones that probably hold the card to strong arm Israel. And so I do believe, yes, that there is a I'm not going to say that is the primary agenda, but I think they are advising Israel, look, even in relation to PR, in relation to the moral authority, in relation to how the people are viewing Israel, yes, minimize the, physical, uh, the civilian casualty. Otherwise, when it comes to the moral and the PR war, you will lose this. So, yes, I do agree that the Americans are advising that reduce it as much as you can and get to your your objective and the objective of Israel is what? Which was initially was to wipe out the uh, uh, Palestinian resistance uh, infrastructure and command centers. All right, Raza, uh, let's look at the casualties. 18,200 have been massacred since the 7th of October. In the West Bank, 278 have been massacred. Let's not even go towards the wounded, around 50,000 wounded as far as uh, Gaza is concerned, around uh, more than 3,400 wounded as far as the West Bank is concerned. Then the uh, United Nations expert warns, and this is uh, uh, mm. came to me not as a surprise, but we need to talk about that, that every single Palestinian in Gaza is going hungry. What happens? Is this deliberate to uh, starve the uh, Palestinians in Gaza uh, to, uh, to result in such a situation that, uh, you know, that, that, that the Palestinians have nothing, I mean, nothing in hand. They already have nothing in hand. Uh, they already are in a dearth as far as water, food, medicine is concerned, or even health facilities are concerned. But to which extent can they be pressed by Israel? 
Uh, I think the um, human rights rapporteur actually stated it's an apocalyptic situation. It's that bad. And uh, yes, the humanitarian situation is dire. Uh, we're now going to be moving into a phase of major famine. Uh, there is no um, uh, basic needs that the a human uh, life would like to operate from. That's no longer available, food, electricity. So what is the actual agenda here? It's quite clear, isn't it? When you just wa watch the scenes, even from your phones, uh, in, uh, complete infrastructure, uh, civilian infrastructure damage, raising Gaza to a mere rubble, and then moving the population, the 1.5 million Palestinians, towards the Rafa. And there is, uh, I think the American spokesman, uh, US Secretary spokesman, was actually pressed by one of the journalists that is there a deal behind the scenes to then displace the Palestinians to Yemen, Iraq, Egypt and Jordan. He refused. However, it means that behind the scenes there are some talks. So yes, um, this is the, probably the end game for Israel to displace the Palestinians and they no longer have a homeland called Gaza. Will Israel succeed in this end game? Secondly, I would also like to uh, quote World Health Organization that says that only 11 or less than a third of Gaza's hospitals remain partially functional and has pleaded for them to remain intact because we know what is happening. The latest being that Israeli forces have now entered the Kamal Adwan hospital in northern Gaza after shelling it. For this. this is not the first hospital that they've entered, it won't be the last hospital. So even the health facilities are, co are being completely destroyed as such. So people have no place either uh, even to go for their basic health facilities or get medicine or get treated. Uh, the, when you look at this from a humanitarian perspective, and we've discussed that in the past as well, Raza, uh, they, there is not a single human being with an onus of humanity in him or her who will not take this as a humanitarian disaster. But there, there are a lot of people who are remaining mum on that across the world. I don't want to name them, but the fact remains that the majority of the powers that be are, who could take action are not taking action. Will they be held responsible in the days to come? Okay, so first part of your question was, will they succeed? Um, you, when you say succeed, whenever you look at war, uh, you have to look at the objectives of each party. What is the objective? Uh, so if Israel has gone to war on Gaza, a military objective should have been to wipe out the infrastructure of Hamas, okay, as a, per se. But is that the case? No. So what they have done, they have um, invoked the Dahia doctrine or the Dahia principle, which was formulated in 2006, uh, post um, uh, the Hezbollah and Israel war, where they said the best way to uh, um, carry forward in the future any war is just to decimate the infrastructure and cause as much civilian damage as possible, which will force the, uh, the resistant factions to come to the pay table because they don't want to be seeing their mothers and their family members dying. This will then force their hand to come to the table. So you can see this doctrine. So it's not very necessarily a military doctrine where you're meeting objectives. It's a pure decimation of civilian infrastructure and uh, civilian casualties on a mass scale. So therefore, Raza, success. Uh, uh Yes, Raza, I'd also like to quote, uh, uh, although I don't like to quote him, but Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu says that the Gaza Strip will be under Israeli military control after the war. This has been reported apparently by the Israeli Public Broadcasting Corporation. Is that also part of the end game? That even when the conflict ends, it's going to be the Israeli military that will be handed over power of Gaza? Correct. Um... I think when I came in your last show, I did actually mention this. So, yeah, Gaza needs to be cleaned out, uh, raised to the floor, and a port city will be then uh, constructed there, which is part of the EAPC, Elat uh, uh, Ashkelon um, Pipeline uh, Corporation. So, yes, uh, and there's going to be a land corridor for the, uh, uh, the uh, trade routes, because at the moment, the Houthis, uh, or should I say Ansarullah, are causing a lot of grievance for the world maritime trade along the Red Sea. Just even recently, just over the last three days, they have stopped seven ships or have warded off many, many ships who are taking Israeli goods to the ports. 
So therefore, uh, Gaza becomes a very important outlet in this geopolitical game of choke points uh, and land corridors. And yes, um, Gaza is part of the plan that they need to clear out and then establish a port city there. So, Raza, there will be no opposition whatsoever if, if we see the way things are going as far as Israel's heinous actions are concerned towards Gaza or towards Palestine for that matter. Opposition, there is opposition because there are camps, of, for example, the Iran-backed uh, uh, Iraqi groups, um, Lebanoni groups, um, you have the Yemenis, Ansarullah, and you have some other small groups. They're playing their part, but they are obviously limited within the nature uh, because if they escalate this uh, this conflict they could uh, iran could be coming into a world war scenario with with world powers with nato so um it's, it's at the moment it's a uh, let's see what happens next no one can predict um uh, one thing i will say israel and only has two months left in january the american administration have told them to wrap this up within two months uh, because they, the world cannot stomach this. It's going on for too long. And maybe since World War II, we've not seen that much destruction, damage. Uh, uh, and, and especially now in the uh, social, digital world that we live in right now, that we're viewing it for our own eyes. And it's not something the world can stomach. So it, it's a very small window. Israel needs to uh, achieve its objectives. Uh, and I think it's going to get worse. Will they succeed? Will Americans stop them? I think um, we have to wait and see. Uh, there's not much hope, but um, this escalation has to be very short for Israel. Otherwise, it suits the axis of resistance if there's a war of attrition. I don't know, Raza, you say that the world needs uh, uh, will not be able to uh, uh, bear what is happening, uh, you use another word, but I'd use a, a synonym, will not be able to bear what is happening. But it has borne what is happening since the last, uh, you know, since the 7th of October. And we are, what now, uh, in the 12th of December today, as we speak, more than two months have passed. They are bearing the, uh, the aftermath of the incursion since the 7th. They are seeing children, women, elderly being massacred, uh, you know, complete places being re completely raised, people being forced to displace from one place to the other and then being fired upon when they reach the other place. I do agree with, with you. When I said uh, the world would not bear it, the average uh, civilian, the average person, the mother, the father, uh, you and me, the average societies, they can't bear it. Uh, if you look at it, there's a lot of uh, social and civic activity going on. For example, um, Starbucks. Uh, there's a lot of boycott and divestment on a lot of Western brands, Zara, uh, Coca-Cola. This has been quite successful in the West. Even in the actual Middle East, Starbucks has lost 14% of its shares. So even in the Middle East, the Arab street, uh, the Arabs are uh, boycotting a lot of the products. This puts pressure on the West. So, and there's been um, protests on the streets of London and all the capitals of the world, at least 500,000, 600,000 people coming on the streets and shouting slogans and appealing and pressuring the, uh, their own governments to come to the Security Council and call for a ceasefire. So yes, um, what I meant was the world can't stomach this. does not mean the world leaders, the governments, it's the people. And this is where they will then look towards their own leaders of their countries and say, where's your moral authority? We voted you in to uh, at least the very least of the freedom of right and speech and movements, which the Western capitalists advocate. The people are not seeing that right now. However, your second half of your comment, I do agree with you. The Israeli agenda is just to wipe out Gaza, displace the civilians, cause as much destruction as possible and take this over. But what I meant was they have to do this in a short period of time. The reason why is it's an economic cost to Israel. At the moment, it's costing $450 million every day, as per uh, Bloomberg. And uh, this cost of war is very expensive. And there's other intangible costs. So 
uh, Israel is taking stock of its losses, mm. economic and financial losses. So therefore, right. the L war has the winner. I I I'll come to the last question, Reza. Uh, let's come back to the United Nations General Assembly session. That is, if it hasn't started sure. as yet, is going to start very very shortly today. Egypt and Mauritania yesterday. I just want to go to the background. Invoked Resolution 377A5 to call for an emergency meeting of the UNGA. The resolution says that if the UNSC is not able to discharge its primary responsibility of maintaining global peace due to lack of unanimity, the UN General Assembly can step in. It is going to step in, but what are the repercussions? Will, if there is a, there is a, is a resolution that is passed uh, by the General Assembly, what impact is it going to have on the current conflict in uh, Palestine? Will it stop? Will Israel be bound by the UNGA? Because we have seen in the past how the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations also severely criticized Antonio Guterres of all people. Um, the actual resolution itself that Egypt and Mauritania is, is going to pass um, or present, shall I say, is non-binding. Okay, uh, so I think that uh, says a lot. However, um, I think this is a test for the UN as an organization which calls for world peace and itself is called United Nations. So this particular resolution is to do with the unity of peace of the world and uh, it's non-binding. Unfortunately, so um, this is a big test for the United Nations as an organization. Can it be effective for any conflicts and future conflicts? A lot of other world powers are watching this too. For example, Russia. Unfortunately, in this phase, in regards to this, uh, it's another resolution that's passed, but it's ineffective. Does it relieve the Palestinians of their dire, play, uh, of their dire situation? All right. Thank you very much, uh, Raza Shah, expert in international relations, to have joined us, to have talked to us about the day 67 of this uh, conflict, this war that is going on in Palestine as we speak, which shows no sign of ending as we speak. Let's hope that this session of the United Nations General Assembly reaps some benefits as far as the people of Palestine is concerned. Let's come to our third story, and that concerns COP28 today. Uh, is more or less the last day of COP28. A lot of expectations were there as far as this important climate summit is concerned. Uh, but a lot of countries say that those expectations have not been met with entirely, especially when it concerns fossil fuels and other issues that uh, the COP28 was supposed to manifest, highlight, and come to a resolution about. There is a draft uh, you know, agreement that has, is being circulated. It has not been signed yet, but all 198 countries need to sign that agreement in order for it to be effective. Vakas Idri, sustainability and climate risk expert, joins us uh, from the UAE. Vakas, thank you very much to have joined us. What are the expectations of the general public? Let's not talk about the countries that are there. From the COP28 conference, do you feel the COP28 will rise up to its expectations? Uh, thank you so much, Omar, for having me. Um, and I'm sorry if you hear some background noise. I'm actually running or scrambling around different pavilions right now because a bunch of text just came out and we are trying to like dissect what has been revised and what has been reworded. Uh, so the question basically is, uh, is exactly the one that you asked. Is, is on everyone's mind. Uh, what are the expectations? What is going to come out of this COP? And after 28 years, are we going to be able to achieve something? Uh, so before right coming into COP, we had like three main things, and this is coming from the public. The general public had three things that they wanted to, uh, to be addressed. The top of the bucket was fossil fuel. Uh, okay. We all know Vakas, we, there's some kind of a communication issue, and we're going to call you back uh, in, in just a bit uh, so that we can hear you properly because there's a bit of incoherence as far as uh, your uh, uh, voice is concerned. Uh, as far as the uh, COP28 is concerned, ladies and gentlemen, until such time that we get hold, hold of Vakas again, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, ap uh, apprehension as far as uh, COP28 is concerned. Climate negotiations uh, are going on as we speak because people want to come to a, a proper agreement as far as uh, uh, COP28 and all the different things that have been discussed uh, during this and even in the past is concerned. Uh, the, the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement for one, then uh, you know there, there are a lot of people who call this a war for survival because this is what climate change is all about. We need to uh, be on the same page as far as uh, climate change is concerned for some action to be taken. Vakas Idris joins us back. Vakas, you were talking to us about COP28 and the expectations. Right. So I'll, I'll just uh, quickly go through it. So basically, there were three expectations for anyone who was uh, who is actually interested in climate change. The top of the bucket was fossil fuels. Uh, the science is there. We know that we need to phase out fossil fuels if we need to if we need to achieve the Paris Accords of two uh, two degrees or ideally 1.5 degrees. 
So that was the biggest thing. The other one was global stock take. We know in Paris Accords, we actually set up the whole framework for it. This is the first time GST has been uh, uh, taken into account and it has been discussed. And language has actually been uh, uh, published on that. And the third one was actually operationalization of loss and damage, especially for, uh, for the most affected countries. So uh, how it has been done is the developing countries and the, the people, the youth, uh, and general public, they are calling on rich nations and developed nations to actually vacate the carbon space. Uh, and, and that is the biggest thing that they want to be seen or reflected in the text across the three things. Um, and I've, I've been saying this uh, all day today that uh, they've actually phased out the term phase out. So, so that, has, that has actually been taken place. And I've seen a lot of quotes and maybes and ifs and buts. No concrete language has still been actually uh, introduced into the text. We just got a bunch of text uh, floated uh, in the main pavilion, and we've been re reading through it. And uh, it's kind of disappointing that after 28 years, we cannot come to a consensus that this is for the collective survival of humanity. It's not about one country. It's not about one person or a specific faction who's impacted. So, so yeah, so those were the general uh, expectations. And I don't think that uh, they have been met to the extent that it should have been met. All right. So uh, what happens now as far as the, uh, of course, we know that the loss and damage fund in the very beginning was operationalized. Will that continue? A. Secondly, the big question mark on the, you know, uh, on the lips of every uh, expert on climate change concern is fossil fuel. What happens uh, to the right. pledges that were made as far as fossil fuel is concerned? Will there be a, a consensus on that? Right. So uh, to target the first question, uh, basically the operationalization of loss and damage, we know that Pakistan played a monumental role last year in COP27, led by Sherry Rahman. Uh, this time around, uh, we, we saw some early successes on the very first day where UAE actually came up, rose to the creation, and we leveraged around 700 million to 800 million of pledges. Uh, since then, over the course of uh, the last two weeks, I was actually doing a, a rough calculation of how much funding has been pledged, either through loss and damage fund or different means. And it, around, it, it actually comes out to around 83 billion. Uh, so there, there have been adaptation and development funds. There's the newly created Altera fund. There's the catalytic fund that he has just launched. Uh, World Bank has announced uh, 9 billion annual increases uh, for, to, for finance on primary projects. But the biggest but is that these are pledges. They, 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 they are, so we need to see when they do materialize into actual funds. And plus, if these are going to be loans or they are going to be grants. Because that, that is the biggest ask from developing countries, from uh, most affected countries, who are already bearing the burden of economic crises and financial crises. So, so, so that is the biggest thing. And uh, the text on finance, climate finance, just came out. And people were actually hoping that there would be a lot of revisions to the originally envisaged text. But so far, it has been very diluted. Coming to your All right, so question. let's see what, what happens. I mean, there are still uh, a bit of time left before this uh, agreement is adhered upon or agreed upon by all the parties concerned. Let's remain cautiously optimistic. But of course, as uh, what you have been saying, understand, we understand that and we also understand that there's, there's a lack of consensus as far as so many issues are concerned. And a lot of people say there's no deal as far as the COP28 draft is concerned. So uh, let, let's see how it all phases out or phases in uh, in the coming hours or days. Thank you very much, Vakas Siddhi, sustainability and climate risk expert who have joined us all the way from the UAE. This brings us to the end of today's news. We'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new story segments that pertain to us, UN, Pakistan. Stay safe. Allah Hafiz.